I'm Lance Meinke. I'm an entomologist at the University of Nebraska. And today I'm going to be talking to you about corn rootworm management, um, especially covering uh, resistance considerations when we're using insecticides and plant tra traits. Uh, I'd like to start out by acknowledging my co authors. Uh, these are graduate students that have been in my program, and they they've generated some of the data that I'm going to be covering in my uh, presentation today. So the general outline I'm going to follow is on the slide. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview of corn rootworm biology and management. And then I'm going to focus down on uh, especially insecticide use, uh, a little bit about plant trait use, but then resistance considerations when we're using both. Um, and then I, at the end, I want to try to talk about the need to develop holistic uh, integrated pest management and resistance management uh, programs in the transgenic era that we're in right now. So to start out with, uh, if you're not familiar, we have two rootworm, corn rootworm species in North America that are really our pest species in the corn belt. And I'm gonna be talking chiefly about the yellow and black striped beetle which is the Western corn rootworm. The Northern corn rootworm, the green beetle, is more localized and it's not as serious a pest across the whole corn belt like the other species. So everything will be focused on the Western corn rootworm. The Western corn rootworm is univoltine, which means that it has one generation per year and it overwinters in the egg stage. So right now, all the eggs are in the soil in the ground until next year when they will hatch. Um, the immature stage or the larval stage feeds on plant roots, and it has a very narrow host range. Uh, it's specific to just certain grasses, and unfortunately for us, uh, the primary host is corn in the United States. The adults are found above ground, and they're very mobile, and they feed primarily on pollen and reproductive parts of plants and they have a very strong affinity for corn. Most of the phylogenetic research that's been done to date uh, has documented that the Western corn rootworm originated either in Central America or Mexico, and then it moved up into the Southwestern US a long time ago, or what was gonna be the US. And then it was first collected in what now is uh, Wallace County, Kansas, very Western Kansas. and and then we saw, you can see on this map, there's been a, a general range expansion across the United States from about 1929 to the present time. The Western corn rootworm really wasn't documented as a pest insect until 1909 when it was first documented attacking sweet corn, but it really didn't become a, a, the serious pest that it is today in field corn until the 1930s, 1940s, uh, in the southwestern part of Nebraska and northwestern Kansas. And some of the things that probably contributed to this was the introduction of irrigation uh, and synthetic fertilizer, especially after World War II. And we started growing large monocultures of continuous corn, which is planting the same uh, in the same field, corn after corn for two or more years. And these large crop islands have been, it's been hypothesized that these islands possibly provided the bridge for this species to build up large densities and then move east, like I just showed you on the last slide. From an injury standpoint, we're most concerned about larval injury, the immatures that feed on the roots. You can see on this uh, slide, there's a an undamaged root system, and then there's a severely damaged root system. And that's what corn rootworms can do. They can prune the roots, um, which will limit nutrient and water uptake. And it also causes the plants to be unstable. And so if you have very wet conditions with high winds, the plants can be blown over, as shown on the other slide on this right here. And so then we end up with both physiological yield loss and we can have some mechanical yield loss during harvest because some of those ears may stay on the ground and the combine can't pick them up. Feeding usually does not lead to economic loss 
Um, periodically, when the corn rootworm phenology gets ahead of the corn phenology, uh, then we can have severe silt clipping taking place right during the pollination period. And when that happens, uh, sometimes you'll get bad nicking and you won't have your, your uh, ear filled out as shown on this slide. And that can yield, that can cause significant yield loss. This slide summarizes the tactics that we have available today to manage the Western corn rootworm. Use of crop rotation from a Western corn rootworm host, which is most of the time is corn, to a non-host such as soybeans, uh, which the, the larvae can't survive on, is our number one recommendation for managing the Western corn rootworm. Transgenic corn is our number one um, tactic that's being used now in continuous corn. Um, and insecticides are still around. We have both foliar and supplied and soil applied insecticides. And I will talk more about those in a little bit. We also have some seed treatments. Uh, there's a high neonicotinoid rate seed treatment still on the market, which can be effective to manage rootworm densities uh, at lower population densities, but it doesn't usually hold up when we get to some of the higher densities that we see in continuous corn. So this slide gives you an overview of the BT traits that are on the market now. This top line, presents the four different proteins that are out there. The first three were originally sold as single traits. And then these have been gradually replaced by pyramids. And pyramid, a pyramid is when you have two or more traits being expressed in a plant that target the same insect species. And so I've got some examples at the bottom of this slide. Uh, and then some of the trade names, are, there are various trade names out there. The most recent one is SmartStax Pro, and this is a little different in that it includes an RNAi-based trait. Uh, it's the first one that has that, plus two BT traits that have been around for a while. So you may be thinking if crop rotation works so well, why continuous corn? Um, the main reason is that there's a very high demand for corn in the U.S. Corn Belt. Uh, we have a lot of areas where there's a lot of livestock production and livestock need a lot of corn for, as, for feed. And then we also have a strong biofuel industry, which also uses a lot of corn every year you know, in some of our corn producing states. In the Western Corn Belt, where we have irrigation, center pivot irrigation, uh, corn is very profitable under irrigation. And in a lot of years, it's probably more profitable than some of the alternative crops that could be grown. So these are some of the reasons why we see continuous corn in the Corn Belt. The Western corn rootworm um, is a highly successful invasive species. And I've also uh, already shown you that, that it can move over large geographic areas. Um, Movement also occurs annually at very local scale as well. Beetles are very mobile, and the females are, have very high reproductive potential. They lay lots of eggs. So it's very easy for them to colonize or recolonize areas very quickly if there is a population density nearby. Corn is the superior larval host, and because of that, the proportion of acres in continuous corn is gonna greatly influence the densities that are in a region over time or on an individual farm. So keep that in mind. We'll talk a little bit more about density, the importance of that later on. To kind of reiterate what I just said, I wanted to give you an example from this last growing season. Uh, this is from a corn field following soybeans in Northeast Nebraska and in this field, we had emergence cages that are shown in this slide. Um, and we didn't record any beetle emergence from this field. Uh, this field contained a double pro hybrid, which means that it had no below ground BT traits expressed. And there was no insect soil insecticide used in this field as well. 
Uh, we also went in and dug roots out of this field and we evaluated them for root injury using the zero to three node injury scale. And we found very little evidence of any rootworm feeding in this field. So this provides really good evidence that rotation to soybeans completely wiped out the existing Western corn rootworm population in that field that was pretty substantial in 2020. And it also documents that rotation, crop rotation to a non-host crop is an excellent Western corn rootworm management tactic. We also placed sticky traps in this field. These are Farrakhan AM uh, unbaited traps. Uh, the beetles are attracted to the yellow and they just you will catch them over time as they fly into these traps. You can see that we had a, a large number of beetles come into this field and colonize this field over the growing season last year, this last year. And this field was adjacent to a long-term continuous cornfield that had a high beetle density. So it really demonstrates that you can recolonize fields fairly quickly if there's a resource population uh, real close. This doesn't always happen. This can be a lot slower process. If you, for example, have a lot of crop rotation around this particular field and there aren't as many beetles around to recolonize, it might take longer, a couple generations uh, versus just one that we're seeing right here. So the challenges with, with corn rootworms are that we can have uh, variable rates of colonization in first year corn fields and densities can build up over time in continuous corn uh, to really medium or high densities. And so this leads us to, to basically dealing with an annual pest problem in our continuous corn fields. So let's talk about Western corn rootworm management and focus on insecticides. Uh, soil insecticides were the primary control tactic used in continuous corn from the 1950s all the way through the early 2000s. And this tactic has been replaced by transgenic plants since that time as the primary control tactic in continuous corn. Our product availability of insecticides has been greatly reduced over time by regulatory action. Uh, a lot of the organophosphate and carbamate insecticides that we commonly used um, are now gone um, for various reasons. So let's, let's focus down just on soil insecticides first. What do we know? Uh, they target the larval or immature stage. It's in the ground, feeding on roots. And these insecticides are usually applied at planting time, either as granules or today, most commonly, a lot of growers will tank mix these with their starter fertilizer and apply them as liquid insecticides at planting time. Soil insecticides are still used and recommended for Western corn rootworm control, especially when you're planting a non-rootworm BT hybrid in continuous corn. And some growers have been using and applying soil insecticides on top of BT transgenic traits or hybrids when they plant. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, a key point on this slide is that we've never seen field of all resistance to soil insecticides when they're applied either in furrow or as a T band over the row. And we think this is because they have a built in refuge. Uh, a lot of corn is planted with 30 inch row spacing, and corn roots grow across the row during the season. These soil insecticides, the way they're applied, will provide uh, good protection of the main root ball of corn, and they, they a lot of times will reduce or prevent lodging. But we have insects that are surviving in between those rows, and we're producing a lot of beetles from those areas of the field. And so they aren't being exposed to the insecticide, and that reduces any selection pressure that might be placed on that population to develop resistance to those insecticides. Because there's mating later on between any insects that are exposed and the ones that aren't exposed. And that dilutes out any, any um, advantage that the insects that survived exposure to the insecticide might have. 
in that population. We've been doing a lot of our farm research in recent years to evaluate a number of, uh, of research goals. One of them is to take another look at soil insecticides. And I talked about earlier uh, that some growers are using soil insecticides on top of traits. And there's been discussion about whether that is worthwhile or not. This study, this graph includes data from 2020 and 2021. And it was 22 fields. And we assessed 10 roots per treatment in each field. So each one of these bars represents over 200 roots. Our non-BT treatment here was, had basically no insecticide and it averaged about a 1.4 to 1.5 node injury score using our zero to three root rating system. And when we added the insecticide on, which in this case was Aztec 4.67G, um, which is an organophosphate plus a small amount of pyrethroid insecticide, we cut the root injury down almost in half. So it, it, it really was beneficial to use the insecticide in this case. When we looked at the pyramids, and the pyramid in this case was smart stacks, which is the CRY 3435 and CRY 3BB1 uh, proteins, we didn't find any significant difference between using and not using the Aztec insecticide. Uh, industry and other states have generated similar data sets. And once in a while, we'll see a field where there might be uh, an advantage of using insecticide, but most of the time we aren't seeing it. Uh, most of the controls being provided by the BT pyramid. And so the insecticide is not adding a lot. Uh, the one thing we have seen that is beneficial potentially is that we have seen less lodging in these fields where we've used Aztec in a pyramid uh, or just Aztec without, with, with the non-BT hybrid as well. And so if you're using this over a BT pyramid, for example, um, and you're using a refuge in the bag uh, product, then the insecticide could reduce lodging in the, in the non-BT plants, the refuge plants, if you have a very high rootworm density present. But otherwise, uh, from strictly a control standpoint, it's not adding much. So let's switch to foliar insecticides. The target stage is the beetle stage or the adult stage. And current uses are to prevent silk clipping that I talked about earlier or to complement other tactics. And this is primarily to try to reduce egg laying uh, so that you'll have less of a population there the next year and what other, whatever control tactics you're using at that time will work better. Most of the foliar insecticides are applied by air uh, or in, in uh, the Western part of the Corn Belt where we have irrigation systems, some of them are chemigated as well. Again, uh, primarily what we have left are pyrethroid insecticides, and then just a couple others in, in, in a couple other insecticide classes, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So we're a little bit limited there as to what we can use in the field. Some general considerations when you're using adult suppression, uh, it's more knowledge and labor intensive than planting time larval preventative tactics. So if you're just putting out a soil insecticide or planting a BT trade at planting time, that's a lot easier than appropriately using adult management. Um, you need to obtain biological information to determine if treatment is justified. So you need to keep track of what your population density is doing in the field. This usually means you need to scout your fields in some way. And then, decide the appropriate time to actually apply the insecticide. Uh, this is very critical for optimal management. So I've, I've included this graph to kind of reinforce what I just said. This is a conventional hybrid, not a BT situation. And the initial beetle emergence started the 27th of June. The blue, the blue line are, is male emergence 
the magenta curve is female emergence. And you can see that the males are emerging a lot faster than the females, which is typical every year. And in a lot of fields, uh, we're hearing more and more that growers are applying a fungicide, sometimes mixed with a pyrethroid insecticide, uh, either at first tassel or sometimes after pollination is over. And this is going to depend on when this happens, depending on uh, the degree, growing degree days within each year. But in this example, it would have been right during this period of time. And so if you're thinking that you're going to get any benefit at reducing the population and reducing egg laying, probably not if you're applying the insecticide this early. There's a lot of misinformation out there about this. And sometimes it's being promoted that that's a good way to reduce egg laying, but it probably isn't. In this case, if you'd apply an insecticide right here, you would kill mainly males and your females would maybe only be 40 to 50% of the total emergence had come out by that time. So what a lot of consultants do in the Western Corn Belt is that they wait until they can see what they call the abdomens drop on females or they, or they look swollen up. And that means they're becoming gravid and getting ready to lay eggs. And then they have a spray window of 10 days to two weeks after that uh, when they actually target applications if you're really trying to reduce egg laying. And when you do that, you're going to kill off a large, lot larger percentage of the females that are out there. Uh, and you probably will make an impact on the density that will be there next year. Now, if this was a BT field, these curves would be shifted more towards later in the season because BT corn, the toxins in BT corn, uh, it affects the immatures that are feeding on the roots. There's a deleterious effect uh, that causes them to slow down their development. And so, the survivors that do come out as adults will emerge later than we would see in a conventional cornfield. So these curves just shift all the way over. And so that's something you need to consider too if you're timing an insecticide application. What type of corn are you growing in that field? This kind of uh, reiterates what I just said. This was published in the Journal of Economic Entomology. And it was a study that uh, where we looked at non-BT and BT corn. In this case, the BT corn was a single trait Cry 3 bb hybrid. Uh, each bar represents the days to emergence after we first saw the, the initial beetle in that field. And so these are means with standard errors around them. And you can see the, the dark bars are female, the lighter bars male. So we got the same relationship I just showed on the last graph that the females are taking longer on average to emerge than the males. We had three treatments, a control, a poncho 1250 seed treatment, and then a Aztec soil insecticide. You can clearly see here that when we switch from a non-BT to a BT, everything is later. Uh, we're getting, it's taking longer for emergence to occur in the control, and then it's the longest where we added an, an insecticide on top of the trait. So that's, the, that's something to really keep in mind when you're trying to target an insecticide application under those types of conditions. So just to summarize, uh, if you're gonna use adult suppression, you need to consider the biological variables, the population dynamics of the insect, and the phenology interactions between the plant and the insect. And then really the application timing is key. You wanna make sure you reach whatever threshold you're using. So you wanna have high enough densities present to warrant an application. And then you wanna have the, the beginning of being able to see gravid females. And here's one in this picture. And a lot of these, if you squeeze their abdomen, you can squeeze out eggs. Uh, and then if you're planting BT corn, you want to make sure you consider those delays in development that are going to cause emergence to be probably longer term and a little flatter emergence curve. 
because you're going to have a combination of BT corn and refuge corn together, usually when we have a refuge in the bag product. We don't recommend adult management as a standalone tactic um, that will hold up without any other tactics. And we, we don't uh, recommend using this every year as well as a routine treatment. Uh, we view this as a tactic in this toolbox along with everything else that should be used sparingly to bring difficult rootworm density situations back under control if you're a farmer that's growing long-term continuous corn. And the other thing to remember is that this is population management. And by that, I mean, there's no refuge. So if you apply an insecticide with an airplane, for example, you're not leaving a refuge in that field. And so in theory, every insect that's in that field um, will probably encounter some dose insecticide when it's applied. Field evolve resistance uh, evolve in specific to specific products that have been applied repeatedly over time in that field. So that's something to really keep in mind. Before we go any farther and I talk about resistance more and resistance management, I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page about what field evolved or field selected resistance really is. It's a genetically based decrease in susceptibility of an insect population to a toxin that's caused by exposure to that toxin. And this could be a transgenic plant or it could be an insecticide uh, in that field over time. So basically you're talking about a chain and change in gene frequency across generations of an insect. Each generation you're, you're having more and more survival and you're having more and more progeny that are resistant until that whole population becomes resistant in a worst case scenario. The other thing you'll see uh, written about sometimes is practical resistance. And this is probably the thing that's most important to pest management practitioners and to growers uh, in their fields. So this is the practical application of resistance where you wanna link heritable change in Western corn rootworm susceptibility that I just talked about. And usually that's done with lab bioassays with actual reduced efficacy in the field. It is possible to have a low level of resistance that you can detect in the lab with the lab bioassay, but it may not cause noticeable control problems in the field or uh, noticeable injury if you're talking about a BT plant until that resistance level gets a little bit higher. And so linking both of these together is called practical resistance. And that's usually what we're most concerned about. So moving on to um, resistance management, the Western corn rootworm is notorious for being highly adaptable to management tactics. And as you can see on this slide, um, rootworm populations, the Western corn rootworm specifically has evolved resistance to at least four different insecticide classes specific insecticides in those classes in kind of a sequential fashion over time. And the pyrethroids is the most recent that we've documented. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, crop rotation in Illinois and the surrounding area where crop annual crop rotation, corn soybean rotation is common and it's been used a lot for many years in a row. Uh, there's been a selection for a rotation resistant strain of Western corn rootworm that lays enough of their eggs outside of corn, for example, into soybeans that will cause economic injury in corn the first year that corn is planted after soybeans. We don't see that in the Western corn belt or most of the rest of the corn belt, uh, but it's primarily an Eastern corn belt phenomenon at this point. And then those four BT proteins that I showed you earlier, um, there is documentation now that we have uh, field evolved resistance to all four of those in, in localized areas in different parts of the corn belt. And so 
the key point of this slide is that resistance management really needs to be a part of any rootworm integrated pest management program. I, I included this slide uh, to give you some perspective on insecticide resistance uh, with some of our products that we've used in the past. Aldrin was one of the original soil insecticides that was used in the 1950s. Methylparathion was used uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. It was airily applied. Cry3BB was one of our first, it was the first BT trade that was commercialized in the Corn Belt. All three of these involved population management. Aldrin was applied as a broadcast applied soil insecticide with no refuge. Methylparathion was applied by air, so there was no refuge. And then Cry3BB1 was expressed in every plant that was planted, except for the small refuge that was mandated by the EPA. The number of generations until we saw resistance was less than 10 for the two insecticides. And that's in insect time, that's only eight to 10 generations, but we only have one generation per year. And so it takes longer with a single generation insect than with some other insects. With Cry3BB, uh, we've recorded some fields as little as three years of continuous use has led to measurable resistance and injury in the field. Resistance ratios were very high with Aldrin, 1000 to 2000 X and relatively low with the other two. And a lot of, lot of our resistance in other insects, such as house flies, you're gonna see that the 1000 to 2000 X resistance. But with rootworms, it is possible to have a slight change in susceptibility that can cause issues with control or crop injury in the field. The other important thing is that there are very low fitness costs, little to no fitness costs associated with the insect metabolically maintaining the mechanisms that allow them to become resistant to these traits and insecticides. And because of that, they've been able to retain this resistance over time, even though products are not being used anymore. With all, we have a lot of populations in the Corn Belt, especially the Western Corn Belt, that are still resistant to methylparathion and aldrin, even though those insecticides are not being used anymore. And so that's, that's something that's really unique with this insect. A lot of insects regress to a more susceptible state over time if you remove selection pressure. So let's talk about uh, pyrethroid resistance a little bit, uh, specifically by fenthrin. Uh, this is applied by air as uh, one of the trade named is Brigade. It was, it's commonly used uh, especially in the Western Corn Belt. And in 2012 to 13 timeframe, we started getting anecdotal reports from Southwestern Nebraska and Southwestern Kansas in these circled areas, uh, indicating that they weren't getting optimal control anymore. And the Western Corn Rootworm is, is a target pest with bifenthrin, but it's also a non-target insect in a lot of cornfields. Bifenthrin is also used a lot for Western bean cutworm control and spider mite control, et cetera. And so Western corn rootworms are exposed to bifenthrin annually in a lot of different ways. So what we did first was develop a diagnostic bifenthrin con concentration using a vial bioassay technique. And we used 10 susceptible populations and developed an LC99. And that's the concentration that will kill 99% of those susceptible populations. And then we use that to screen populations that were sent to us to get an idea of what the susceptibility level is. And so we had cooperators from across the Corn Belt send us beetles. And you can see all the data is on this slide over here, which is kind of messy to look at. But in the long story short here is that if you go east of Nebraska, Almost all these populations are very susceptible. And these are all the populations that are showing primarily 90 to 100% kill with this diagnostic dose. As we got into Nebraska and moved 
towards the southwestern part of the state. We got less and less. Uh, actually, we got more and more survival in the bioassay. And so the beetles were hardly being killed when we got down to these red dot areas in both Kansas and Nebraska. So this told us that it, it's strongly suggested we might have a resistance problem that's uh, evolved. So we brought populations in the lab from those affected areas and did more intensive uh, dose response vial bioassays so we could calculate uh, the lethal concentration that kills 50% of the population and then looked at resistance ratios. And you can see compared to our control population, uh, we had significantly higher LC50s and the resistance ratios were not extremely high. They were in the six to about 10X range. And again, this is pretty low for resistance a lot of times with a lot of other insects, but this was enough to cause noticeable control problems in the field. We felt like we had the onset set of a low level of by fentanyl resistance in these affected areas. And we also felt like it was caused by selection of the adult population. Um, that was done in 2014, 2013. Uh, we went back to these same areas in 2018 and 2019. And there's a lot of numbers here you don't need to pay attention to. Uh, we looked at bifenthrin, dimethoate, which is an organophosphate that's commonly used. And then also in doxycarb, which is not a new insecticide, but it was fairly newly registered for uh, beetle control use. We used the same control population that we uh, looked at in 2014, plus another control population, and also a field population that was relatively susceptible as our uh, control populations. And to make a long story short, uh, we had a tremendous increase in resistance to bifenthrin, 23 to 55 fold. Dimethoate was 7 to 16 fold. And endoxicarb was 0.3 fold, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, but this indicated that uh, they were super, these resistant populations were super susceptible to endoxicarb. Another question that we had was if we selected this resistance through the adult population, is this gonna impact the larval population as well? And any um, pyrethroid soil insecticides that might be used. So we did some larval bioassays and found that we only had about a five-fold LC50 resistance ratio, uh, <laughs> which wasn't too much different than the initial um, resistance ratio that we found uh, when we first discovered bifenthrin resistance in southwestern Nebraska. When we did just traditional insecticide trials with formulated insecticides in these affected areas where there's adult resistance, Capture and Forest, which are two trade names for bifenthrin and tefluthrin, both failed in on-farm trials in southwestern Nebraska. We had just as much injury in these treatments as we did in our control. And we also showed a cross resistance between bifenthrin, tefluthrin, and cyfluthrin, which are all parts of registered soil insecticides. So it, it did, we did find out that the low level resistance was enough to cause problems in the field and low levels of resistance could cause both adult and larval issues in the field. We've also looked at some adult management um, situations in northeastern Nebraska in recent years, uh, 2019 and 2020. Um, there's a lot on this slide. What you're looking at are whole plant counts, which are used by consultants a lot in Nebraska to make management decisions. Uh, the blue bar, the light blue bars are before any insecticides applied. The dark blue is after application. And this side of the graph are the five fields that were sprayed. And these were all uh, tank mixes of an organophosphate and a pyrethroid. And growers were going primarily with 
the cheapest route they could find, which were generic products that were off patent. Four out of the five had spectacular control, so we had really susceptible populations. We had one field, uh, not optimal control. And when we went back and repeated this in 2020, uh, in a number of fields in this county and another neighboring county, uh, we, we got the same result. And so we started being suspicious that we might uh, have the beginning of resistance in these fields as well. Whenever we ran these, we also had fields that we monitored in the same area uh, that were not treated. And you can see that the population over about a week's period of time, when we did the before and after whole plant counts here and here, uh, changed very, very little. So that reinforces how well the soil insecticide or the foliar insecticides performed in most of the fields in uh, northeastern Nebraska with that tank mix. We took some of the populations into the lab and did the same thing that we did earlier, did some dose response file bioassays. And most of them were very susceptible compared to our control. The field that had had control problems, field six, uh, we collected beetles before and after we sprayed because there were lots of live beetles after we sprayed. And you can see that there was a, a, a significant difference in LC50. It was a lot higher in, those in that field than the other um, fields in the area and the control that we were using. Uh, and then the other thing that was interesting is that the resistance ratio was in that 6x to 7x range which was the same range we saw in southwestern Nebraska when we first detected pyrethroid resistance. This field had a history of pyrethroid use and we had control issues in the field. So we concluded that we also have the onset of resistance in this county as well. My graduate student, Darianne Sosa, uh, for her PhD, did some mechanisms of resistance work. And we found that we have higher activity of esterases and P450s in pyrethroid resistant populations. So both oxidative and hydrolytic metabolism contributed to pyrethroid resistance. And especially the cytochrome P450 appears to, appears to be a really major mechanism uh, in the Western corn rootworm pyrethroid resistance situation we're seeing in Nebraska. Now, the one interesting thing related to this is that the same uh, hydrolytic metabolism and oxidative metabolism can also be involved in organophosphate and carbamate insecticide resistance. So it is possible to have cross resistance between what we're seeing with pyrethroids and what we could see with these other insecticides, some of which are still used in the same area. Uh, one interesting point is that to date, we haven't seen any sodium channel KDR mutation. This is usually that knockdown resistance that we see with, it's common with pyrethroids. And so far, we haven't seen that um, in our work done to date with pyrethroid resistant Western corn rootworms. Uh, more work needs to be done in this area to look at this in more detail. So in general, if we summarize considerations related to foliar insecticides, you need to scout your fields and apply an insecticide only when needed. And then application timing is very critical for optimal control. If you apply it too early, uh, you're probably not going to reduce egg laying. And then we've also uh, clearly shown that low levels of pyrethroid resistance are enough to cause performance problems with pyrethroids, both soil insecticides and foliar insecticides. And then a substantial increase in pyrethroid resistance can ramp up after continuous insecticide exposure. We recommend rotating insecticide classes, especially in doxycarb with pyrethroids. In doxycarb is in a different insecticide class, and we have negative cross resistance when pyrethroid resistance is present. And that's, that's why we saw that resistance ratio less than one uh, in our lab bioassays. 
Uh, doxycarb is bioactivated by esterase enzymes that are present in the target insect, in this case, Western corn rootworm. And that's needed to become a more toxic compound that actually kills the insect. When you have a, resist, a pyrethroid resistance population, you have increased activity of hydrolytic enzymes already. And so when you put indoxicarb into that environment, into that jacked up enzyme environment, you're gonna have really quick activation of the indoxicarb and it's gonna kill at a very high level very quickly. So it's a great resistance management compound uh, to use where we have resistance to, to pyrethroids or it's just a rotational compound with pyrethroids when we don't have resistance. Key points, um, whether you're working with Bt corn or a foliar insecticide, there are two main things that are gonna really determine whether you're having a control problem or not. And that's whether or not you have high enough density present and some level of resistance. And so managing density is a key component of preventative or resistance mitigation efforts when you're working with Western corn rootworm. So some general conclusions. Uh, it's been clearly shown in a number of studies that local management practices and associated selection pressure placed on a, a local population are key drivers of Western corn rootworm susceptibility to both foliar insecticides and BT traits. Um, but even though resistance evolves at the local level, because of that beetle movement capability I talked about earlier, um, resistance alleles can be moved around in the landscape. And so when I talked about earlier about uh, beetles reinfesting first year corn, there are a number of examples that have documented that uh, a highly resistant population can reinfest a first year corn field. And then the resulting population that's gonna be there afterwards can be resistant to either BT traits or insecticides that have never been used in that field before. And so that's something growers need to be aware of, especially if they're in an area uh, with a lot of continuous corn and a lot of trait use or a lot of insecticide use. You could have something move into your rotated field that wasn't there before. So to slower mitigate the evolution of resistance, we recommend a more holistic multi-tactic approach than just using one tactic repeatedly until you burn it out. Uh, this is especially important with our less than high dose uh, traits that are out there. We do get some natural survival with all the BT events that are on the market right now. And we've also shown that just using a refuge alone with our current BT traits that we have available was not enough to prevent fairly quick resistance evolution from occurring. The other negative we have right now is that we can't really rotate BT traits because of cross resistance. We have cross resistance between all the CRY3 traits, these three here. CRY3435 is not cross resistant, but it's used because we're mixing and matching a lot of these traits. It's part of many of the pyramids that are being used now. So even if you switch companies from one pyramid to another, you're liable to have this as part of it. So you're not ro really rotating anything. So we really need new traits on the market that the rootworms haven't been exposed to that we can actually use a true trait ro rotation. Use crop rotation whenever possible and rotate insecticide classes where appropriate. So to conclude, I wanna just talk a little bit about uh, kind of the conceptual framework that a lot of consultants in the Western Corn Belt use to work through with their clients. They ask their clients to, to, to look at their landscape dynamics, farm level, and what are their neighbors doing as far as uh, cropping patterns? Are they in the middle of just solid continuous corn with high rootworm densities? Or they are, are they in an area with crop rotation uh, that may have a lot lower rootworm population? Uh, most growers have some idea whether they're fighting rootworm densities every year. They have very high densities or whether they're in an area that's mainly surrounded by crop rotation. 
And so we have very low root one populations. Remember, density management is a big factor in trying to keep resistance under control and also provide annual rootworm control as well. And then what, what tactics have you used recently? Uh, are they working? And have you been using the same tactic for a long time? If you have, you might wanna mix it up a little bit or you might run into a resistance situation and then have a train wreck uh, in the future. So use that history to evaluate your relative risk associated with different management strategies. And then try to focus on annually, you wanna to try to get the best rootworm control you can to get the best yields during that season. But then also think longer term, what can I do to uh, manage resistance over time, resistance evolution? And so, with the traits and crop rotation and all the tactics we have right now, which in some of them are somewhat limited, you want to think longer term about trait and tactic combination rotations or sequences of different tactics. Use crop rotation where it fits. Use a non-BT hybrid after rotation, and then use insecticides as appropriate to manage densities once in a while. And with that, that concludes my presentation.